Are you guys ready for God's Word today? Yeah, I'm ready too. And man, I, it's going to be good. I'm telling you, we're going to have fun today. And so why don't you get your Bible and turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And I'm really excited what I have to share. It is challenging in a way, but I think it's going to prove to be so helpful in, in so many ways. Um, and I'm really excited about, as you know, a lot of times I will teach in a series, but this, the last few weeks I haven't been in a series. I just wanted to share some things that I, God had put on my heart in the recent months. And I'll be honest, really the message I had today is not exactly the message that I'm preaching. <laughs> um, because with me, I, you know, I pray and I kind of outline where I think God wants me to go and God, you know, kind of have all these ideas, at least what I think. And Monday when I sat down, I said, God is kind of this the direction we're going. And I really felt like, because uh, it kind of had an, you know, the start of an outline pretty much done really anyways. And I just, he just kind of just, we just kind of hung a ride. It's, it's similar in, in, in genre and vein and you know, topic and theory, I guess, but, but it's a little bit different, but I was, I, I loved it. I was like, God, this is such good truth. And so I, I hope you'll lean in today. So we're in Exodus 32. So in Exodus chapter 32, this is where Moses uh, has, deli- or Charlton Heston, depending on, Hest- you know, <laughs> just depending on which version you're most familiar with, but the guy that said, let my people go, that guy has led God's people, Israel, out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, and they're in the wilderness and Really, the first major stop they make here is out Mount Sinai, um, and uh, a lot is going on. Like God wants to to meet with his his people. In fact, he said, "You know, come out in the wilderness and meet with me." That was what he had Moses tell Pharaoh, like, "Let them come out and serve me and worship me." And and so this happens at Mount Sinai, and God ultimately comes down on the mountain, and He really wants to meet with Israel, and He wants them to hear His. His voice, um, but unfortunately, they pull back and say, "No, Moses, this is too much for us. You you meet with God and you tell us what God's saying, but we, but we're just we can't do it, right?" And so, anyways, Moses ends up on the mountain with God for about forty days, and that's what gets us to Exodus thirty-two. Because, and I'll just kind of tell you, and then we'll read it. But um, this was one of those great stories in the Bible that if you grew up in church, anybody grew up in church, if you grew up in, like me, yeah, a lot of people grew up in church. If you didn't, it's okay. I'm going to explain everything. Don't worry. All right. And all the verses be on the screen. So you don't feel like, oh no, I won't be able to understand. No, no, no. But it just, if you grew up in church, we had teaching tools back then that if you grew up in church, you understand flannel boards and flannel thing. Yeah, the flannel board, right? And so this was one of those because it's, it's where we're going to talk about this golden calf that Aaron made because the children, God's people, the children of Israel asked him to make them a God. So, and this is one of those flannel graphs, you know, and so you'd have the golden calf and Aaron, and then you have Moses up on the mountain on this side of the flannel, and then the air conditioner would kick on and it'd blow them all off the flannel, and you gotta, you know, you get the flannel board out again, and you gotta try, anyways, this is, this is that story. So Moses on the mountain, while he's on the mountain, the people come to Aaron and they're like, we don't know what happened to Moses. Like he is MIA. And so why don't you make us a God that can go before us? And so they, the one verse that says, we'll read it. One, the, one verse is they took these earrings out of their ears, but one says they break them off. But they took these golden earrings out and threw them in the fire, melted them down. Aaron fashions a calf, a golden calf out of this and then sets it before the people. And they say, yeah, this is our God who's going to lead us out and deliver us. And, and, and then they proclaim a festival to the Lord. And they just, they just really go high and to the right, just way off track, outside of God's will, plan, standard, and all that. And God actually has to tell Moses, kind of a couple comedic things here. If we read the, the way I see it, God tells Moses, you got to go down because your people have gone crazy. Like, I think it's pretty bad when God's like, no, they're your people. And Moses is like, no, they're your people. And so then, then I love the explanation Aaron gives because, you know, Moses like, you know, I'll leave the, the assistant preacher in charge to go meet with God and come out. And next thing I know, Aaron, you've, you've gone crazy. And I love Aaron's explanation because he's like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> he's like, we threw the gold in the fire and this calf came out. This sounds very much like a toddler, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, you know, that age when something went really bad. Like, I don't know how the drapes caught on fire. 
We were just playing Legos. And the drapes caught on fire. It was so weird to us too. You know, it's, it's anyways. So we're going to read this together. So that's kind of what's going on now. We'll just read it. So now everybody be tracking with this verse. Chapter 32, it says, verse 1, it says, When the people saw Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come on, make us gods who will go before us. Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened. And Aaron answered and said, Well, take off the golden earrings. One verse says, Break off the golden earrings that your wives, your son, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron and he took them and he he took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Remember, the Bible tells what happened. Aaron's like, I don't know. We threw the gold in, cow came out. Um, And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced tomorrow is going to be a festival of the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in in revelry. In in other words, they were going crazy. There's a lot that word means, but we'll just keep it all PG and say they were going nuts. All right. Verse (laughs) 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, you got to go down. Because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt and they've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made for themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. And so they bowed down to it and sacrificed and said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I call this message, All That Glitters. All That Glitters. Let's pray together. God, we we do thank you that we get the opportunity to open your word. And not only that, we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit who explains it, who brings it to life. And so, Holy Spirit, we don't want to miss you, and we don't want to miss your truth, so speak to us and let us take to heart everything you say to us today. Um, In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Probably everybody, most people are probably familiar with the... It's an aphorism, really. Uh, All that glitters isn't gold. Most of you have probably heard that. It actually comes from 16th century Shakespeare uh, from the play The the Merchant of Venice. Um, But it's this line in there that says, you know, all that glitters is not gold. And I think today in, in our world, there's a lot of things that glitter, a lot of things that look good, a lot of things that seem right, but kind of the basis of this aphorism is that um, just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. Just because it looks right doesn't mean it is right. And just because it looks true doesn't mean that it is true. Sometimes things are not all what they seem. They're not what they are cracked up to be, other colloquial phrases for that. And when I thought about this, I thought the irony was this calf glitters and is actually gold. But the problem is it's still the wrong thing. It's still taking them in the wrong direction. It's still not really true. It's still not really right. It's still not really good, but it, it glitters. And when I looked at this passage, there were just some things that jumped out at me that I want to share with you as we kind of try to apply because I figured out, I hate to say it, but sometimes we're not much different than we're God's children and they were God's children. They were tempted and we can be tempted. And sometimes we do exactly what they did. Now, you may not have a golden calf at your house. And maybe you do. I don't know. If you do, come and let's sacrifice it for the building. But, you know, (laughs) amen, let's melt it down for the glory of God. Praise the Lord, right? So, but, (laughs) but maybe you don't have a golden calf, but we are still tempted in similar ways as we still do some of the same things. And so let's work through this together. Three things. If you're taking notes, I have three points, mostly because I'm anointed and God is good and you don't have time for four. Um, But the first one, (laughs) the first one is this, write this down. Everyone serves a God. 
Now, I know on your screen, it's all caps, so you don't know that uh, the word God here is lowercase. The great psalmist Bob Dylan um, <laughs> released a song in, the 19, in 79 called You Gotta Serve Somebody. I don't know if you've heard it. It might be worth a trip. I mean, Bob Dylan, someone asked me about this after the first one because I said, you ought to go to YouTube and check it out. And they're like, he was a horrible singer. I'm like, yeah, but he was a great writer. That's, that was the thing. Bob Dylan, you can't understand what he says at all. Um, that's true. That was the point they were making. You know, and I don't disagree with that, but he was very creative. And, and in fact, he wrote a really cool song. I don't remember when, at one point, uh, in his, out of his relationship with God called Saved. And it was really cool lyrics, but but he wrote this one because you got to serve somebody, you know. Oh, you got to serve somebody, you know. That's my best Bob Dylan, <laughs> you know. But the next lyric was, "It may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody." I think the greatest illusion today is that that you don't have to serve somebody. Like I think today one of the greatest misconceptions or or even deceptions of the enemy is that you don't have to choose a God, you can just serve yourself. But if you'll think back in the Bible to Genesis, the first form of idolatry was not worshiping an idol, it was worshiping self. Because ultimately, this was the deception brought to Adam and Eve. Do what's right for you. Live your truth. Live the life you want to live. Make what decision is best for you. Like, I know God has said this, but you choose what's best for you. And that essentially is idolatry. Putting something or someone in God's place, even if it's you. And so many times I, I think the enemy is so crafty and he just like just like with Adam and Eve, he is so deceptive that he just whispers to us like, it's okay, like God wants you to be happy. No, 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 listen, listen, listen. God wants you to be holy. You want to be happy. God wants you to be holy. In fact, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but God actually never promised you happiness. He promises you joy. But joy is not based on circumstance. When we talk about happiness, we're talking about circumstance. God promises joy. So this this idea, and one one preacher said this, and probably most people heard this analogy, but they're like, you know, in your heart or in your life, there's this God-shaped void, you know, this place that only God can Feel and unfortunately for all of mankind, everyone has fallen subject to this at point. Everyone at some time tries to get something else to fit in that place. And essentially, that is the definition of idolatry. You gotta serve somebody. And many times the way the enemy, Satan, gets you to serve him is by convincing you you're serving you. Listen, he does not have a problem with you worshiping a God. He just doesn't want you to worship the God. If he can't stop you from worship, he'll just get you to divert it. But, but you got you to gotta serve somebody. And, and here we have these, this, the children of Israel. And you got to see this picture. This, this is worthy of writing down what I'm about to get to. But... but to them, their relationship with God was through Moses. Because we see this like Exodus 20 is where they say, no, you go meet with God and, and we'll just stay here. And you just tell us what God says and we'll do it. And when Moses goes up on the mountain and he's gone for like 40 days, the, the real problem is they're disconnected from God. And this is what's worth writing down is the more disconnected from God I am, the more discontented with God I am. Like the more disconnected from God we are, the more discontent with God we become. 
Like this, this, this is what the enemy is after. He's like, hey, look, they get disconnected from Moses, which is their relationship with God because they don't have one personally. It's through him. And now they're like, you know, we're just not kind of, ha- we're not really happy with God. We're not really happy with Moses. Let's look to something else. Can we get, just make a God? Can we just find something else to serve? Something else that, that is, fills the void, if you will? And like, like this is, the, this is the, the, the dangers. Ultimately, the enemy, like this is what he knows. He knows like if you are staring in the face of Jesus, like if you're, like the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finish. Like if you are caught focused on him and you keep your focus from him, all that glitters doesn't get your attention because all that glitters pales in comparison with the beauty and and the splendor and the wonder that is Jesus. And he knows that. So what he does is he has to make something glitter to get you to turn aside because he knows if I can get you disconnected from God, I can make you discontent with God and I will look for something else or someone else and I will think, oh, uh, you know, a promotion would fill that void. A relationship would fill that void. A car, a house, some of the material, a substance, I, any number of things. Some good, some even, some even bad, but, but some are good. Sometimes we just try to put good things in the God place. And this is, this is what the enemy knows is that if I can just distract you, just like Eve. Like, hey, let's talk about this tree. Let's, let's think, look, look at how it glitters. Look at how amazing it is. This, this is probably the thing that you need. The, the next thing I was looking at this is, is so amazing to me, but um, when they went to make this calf, uh, it, it, I told you that it said they took off their um, their earrings, but uh, in the New King James Version, and I think also in the ESV, that was, we left, read NIV, but um, in the New King James Version, Exodus 32, 2, it says this, and, and Aaron said, Aaron said, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of, you know, your wives, your sons, and daughters, but break, break them off. And I thought, this, this, is, this is what's really sad. Their God came from them. And this, listen, so many times we think, well, I would never do that. But so many times we establish in our lives, from our lives, what we're going to serve. And, and, and we, we, like, like we actually make a God that comes from us. And we decide this is going to be our God. And we pick it. Sometimes we create it, but sometimes we're, we're the ones that are determining what the God is that we're going to serve. In other words, you know, here's the truth of it is. Everybody's going to serve someone. You get to pick your deliverer. The problem is sometimes we pick deliverers that can't deliver. You get to pick your God, but sometimes we pick gods and we create gods that come from us instead of realizing we came from God. Then I like this because it said they broke, they broke these off. When I saw that, I thought... Isn't it, isn't it so true? Because like this is, this is the caution. We should never make a God out of the broken pieces of our lives. Because is that not the temptation sometimes to let the brokenness in our lives determine what our God is or who our God is? I mean, there are people who, who are unfortunately and devastatingly, you know, dependent upon substances. And it's not that that's what they want. That's just what they run to because of the broken pieces of their life. The question is, whatever you're running to, does it have the power to deliver you? You can run to Visa, but can Visa really save you? You can run it. To, to relationships, but can relation, you know, you pick it, can the promotion, but, but, but don't, don't, and this is what we do, be, be careful to not let the broken pieces of your life determine who God's. Here, here's another thing, don't let the broken pieces of your life tell you who God is. 
Don't let the brokenness in your life define God. There are a lot of people today serving a powerless God because of disappointment in their life. And they have determined because God didn't do what they thought he should have done. And, and listen, I've had to deal with this too, so don't listen. I know what it's like to be on the, the backside of the excrement hitting the rotary device and wonder where God was. And I get it, but you can't, listen, we can't see God through the broken places in our life. We have to let God reveal himself to us through the broken places of our life. And so we can't, don't let disappointment, discouragement, and brokenness try to tell you who God is. The next thing that's all here is, is this word fashioned. Fashioned, like you're going to serve somebody. How do we get these gods? Well, here's what they did. The Bible says they, 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 they well, the verse we read, I'll read a different way. It said he used a fashioning tool. But verse four in a different version says, Exodus 30, 32, four says, and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it. He fashioned it. And when I, I looked at that, this is what's crazy. When I looked at that, word, it just, something resonated. So to me, I have, you know, super cool Bible software. And so I can look up really a couple clicks and I can get the Hebrew word there. And then I can find where that word is used throughout the Bible. Cause obviously the Bible's written in Hebrew not, or with well, the old Testament written in Hebrew, not in English. And, and so, you know, the first place this word is used, the, the Hebrew word is Yatsar, Y-A-T-S-A-R, Yatsar. The first place it's used is in Genesis when it says, and God formed man. And I'm like, is this not the deception of the enemy? We are created in the image of God and recreated in the image of God and the Holy Spirit conforms us to the image of Christ. We are created in the image of God and we are created in the image of God and too many times we try to create God in our image or recreate him in our image. And we try to fashion him when really he's the one that's supposed to form us. And we create a God out of what we understand or what we believe, or in this case, what we want. You know what's so crazy about this golden calf? Is, is at first, he says, these are your God's who delivered you. And he uses the Hebrew word Elohim, which is one of the most frequently used words for God, especially in Hebrew in the Old Testament. I can kind of give a pass because sometimes that word does refer to foreign gods. But then he says, so tomorrow is going to be a festival to the Lord. That Hebrew word is Yahweh. Listen, if we're not careful, we will create a God that we want. We'll create a God that comes from us at our, even sometimes our broken places. And we will fashion a God really that serves our interest and put Yahweh's name on it. Because sometimes idolatry is serving an idol. Sometimes idolatry is serving self. Sometimes idolatry is serving a distorted image of who God really is. And sometimes what happens is, I'm, okay, I'm going to get in your business, but, but, I, but I love you, okay? Sometimes we like to serve a God um, who agrees with our preferences. Sometimes we like to serve a God who no longer calls our sin, sin. That's okay with our compromises. That's accepting of our lifestyle choices. And, 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 and the way we do that is we just throw out this word grace. So what we do is we create a golden calf that's okay with however we want to live and name it Grace. Grace. 
We, we fashion it with our hands. We make it with our hands. We, we make a God that understands us, a God that's full of love but has no justice, a God that offers mercy but no correction. And, and what we do then, after we've fashioned this God that is okay with all of our lifestyle choices and our preferences and how we want to live and what we want to do and the sin we don't want to change and the compromise we're not want to deal with, then we just stamp his name on it and say, that's my God. And we will go to his word and manipulate his word to justify this is him instead of going to his word to find out who he is. Can I tell you something? If your God never disagrees with your choices, you're not serving God. You're serving an idol. If your God never convicts you of anything, you are not serving God. You have made something in the image that works for you and just put his name on it. So we're all serving somebody. The question then becomes, who are you serving? And, and it's not enough to say God because that's what they called the calf. Well, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people today serving God that's really just a calf they put God's name on. But it may be the devil and it may be the Lord, but you go ahead and serve somebody. Here, here's the second thing. If God is God, then write this down. Only God gets to define who God is. Only God can define who he is. In other words, he's God. I can't tell God who he is. He has to tell me. The, the great thing about the Bible is it's full of verses. And I, I don't know, I thought about 50 verses offhand where God describes who he is. I mean, there's some great ones like in the book of Romans where he's like, I call the, you know, uh, no, he said, I, I call things that aren't as though they were. And like, I mean, there's like, like I am God, you know, I mean, there's just like really cool, like that's like superpowers. Like, how does he do that stuff? You know, but, but just real quick, like Isaiah 46, where he says, I am God. A lot of places he'll say, I'm God and there's nobody else. I am God and there are no others. And he says, I am God. This is Isaiah 46. He says, I'm God and there's none like me. And he said, I create the end from the beginning. Like what a great description. God describes himself. And he says, here's something I do that nobody else can do. I start at the end and then go back to the beginning and end up where I wanted to be. Isaiah um, 45, 18 is another place. It says, for, for this is the Lord who created the heavens. This is his power. Like I created the heavens. I formed the earth and made it. I established it. I didn't create it in vain. I formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there's nobody else like me. Like God gets to define who he is. We don't have the right to tell God who he is. Exodus 34, 6, it says this, and this is one of, my, one of the great descriptions of God in the Bible, but it's a couple of chapters after where our text was. But verse 6, it says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. Look, he's going to tell us who he is. The Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Like, Paul's right there. These are all the things we love to talk about God for. Like we love to hear, and it is absolutely true. Like he is abounding in goodness, and he is merciful, and he is gracious, and he is long-suffering. All those things are very, 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 very accurate. But God in his description of himself, he didn't stop there. He said, by no means do I clear the guilty. Then he said, I will actually visit iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. In other words, let, let me give you a word for what he just said. He said, yes, I am loving and kind and gracious and good, but I am also just. One of those words we don't want to talk about when it comes to God. But if he, listen, you can't have mercy without justice. Because mercy is where you don't get what you do deserve. Justice tells me what I deserve. Mercy saves me from it. Justice tells me what I don't deserve. Grace gives it to me anyway. So to, I, I cannot have mercy and grace in the absence of justice. 
There is no mercy and grace in the absence of justice. There is no long suffering in the absence of justice. Can't really understand goodness in the absence of justice. And so when God defines himself, this is what you need to know. God's like, hey, I'm all these wonderful things, but I am very just. Sin will be fun- punished. Like everyone is going to be judged. I don't know if you know this, but according to the Bible, it's important unto man wants to die and then everyone is going to be judged. And if you are in Christ, you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged for what you did with Christ. If you're, if you're outside of Christ, you're going to be judged for, for what is yours because you didn't receive him. It's very clear throughout the scripture. And some of the, I mean, some of the descriptions, God, I want to read, like there's one in Hebrews chapter 12 where it's talking about this darkness and this power. It's just this ominous picture. But, but it's actually, when you look at it, it's like, is God trying to scare us? No, no, no. It's good news. Because when you see these, these pictures of power and this greatness of God, it's like, that's my God. And if that is for me, no wonder nothing can be against me, Right? But it's the same thing when it comes to the justice. The justice of God is actually good news. Because, and let me explain. Outside of Christ, the justice of God says, your sin is on your own head. You're gonna pay the penalty for it. But if you really accept Christ, I'm not talking about a friendly, casual, say a prayer. I'm talking about if you really surrender your life to Christ, like biblical salvation, where you surrender everything and give all of your life to follow him. I am not talking about convenient Christianity, which I'm not even sure includes salvation anymore. I'm talking about dying to self and following Jesus with all of your heart, with all of your soul and all of your strength, like true conversion then you need to understand under accepting that grace and true conversion because all of your sin was placed on Jesus, because he paid the penalty for your sin and by faith you believe it, now it is the justice of God that that declares you innocent. You want God to be just because listen to me, there's no salvation without the justice of God. He is completely just in forgiving the sinner who has placed their faith and surrendered their life to Jesus. So he says, my justice was poured out. Wrath was poured out. Judgment was poured out on him. Having accepted that, then you have been freed from that. And it is actually his justice that says. So here's the point. God gets to define like who he is. God gets to tell you who he is. Here's another thing. Think about this. If God gets to define who he is, God gets to define the standard that he holds. Like we're talking about, remember, we're talking about golden calves and all that glitters and you could put idolatry on it and people, I'm not, a, not an idol, but again, maybe, maybe as we're discussing this, maybe that might want to be reconsidered because if I'm living for myself, it's idolatry. But, but think about this. If God gets, God gets to define who he is because he's God, but then God gets to define his standard. God gets to define what truth is. You, you don't have the option to live your truth. That would make you the God. If he's God, I have to live his truth. He gets to set the, he gets to set the standard of what is right and what is wrong. He gets to define what a righteous lifestyle is. If he gets to define who he is, then he gets to tell me what he expects. He gets to tell me what the standard is. And then not only that, he gets to tell me how I live for him. Think about it. If if he is God and he defines himself, right, then he gets to tell me right and wrong and truth. He, He gets to define the standard. Then he gets to tell me how to serve him. I don't tell him how I'm going to serve him. He gets to tell me how to serve him because he is God. I don't get to tell him what he can do for me. I look to him and say, how do I serve you? How do I live for you? How do I follow you? Because you're God and I'm not. 
When we get this mixed up, right, we start telling God, this is what I'll do for you. And this is the standard that I'll hold to. And this is who I think you are. Like once we define our own God, we define our own standard and we define our own lifestyle. That's why all throughout the Bible, hundreds of scriptures where God's like, this is who I am because I get to tell you who I am is what God says. Because if you don't let me define me, then you won't let me identify the standard that you're supposed to live and you won't let me prescribe the way that you're supposed to worship and serve and follow me. And this is why the enemy comes. Listen, he wants you. He wants you to craft your own calf and put God's name on it. Because once you define your God, you define the standard and you determine the life you're going to live. Essentially, that's how idolatry works. It's how worship, like worship God in the beauty of his own. In other words, see him, let him, let him determine who he is. Why? So then his standard is what you cling to and his prescribed way of living is how you live. So if God's God, he gets to define who he is. I don't get to make one up and put his name on it. Now, here's why all of that is so important. Because of point three. Point three is the God you serve determines the power you see. That's why this is so important. One of my favorite, it's a good flannel board Sunday school story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is 1 Samuel chapter 5. And 1 Samuel chapter 5, it's, it's bad because it's, it's one of those, it's a bad time, but it's a funny thing because the Philistines have actually captured the Ark of the Covenant of God. So there's this Ark, you know, that they crafted and inside it, there's certain things like Aaron's staff and some manna and the Ten Commandments and it represents you know, God's presence with his people. And so it's like, this is God's presence right here. And they capture it and they bring it back to this place called Ashdod where they had this temple set up to one of their gods, Dagon. And so they put the ark in their temple where their god, Dagon, who they believed, if you've heard, like in the Bible where it talks about Baal, Dagon was actually like the father of Baal. He was like part man and I think part kind of fish, and, and so, interesting character, and they believe somehow he was the God over the harvest or grain. I mean, there's a lot of beliefs, but, but he was their God, right? And they put the ark next to their God in their temple, and they, and they leave, and the next morning they come in, and their God, Dagon, has fallen down in front of the ark of God and is laying prostrate, this big statue has fallen down and is laying prostrate essentially before the Ark of the Covenant. And they're kind of like, well, that's odd. <laughs> right about then I'd be thinking, I wonder if I picked the wrong horse. I don't know. Um, so, so then they stand their God up again and they leave him. They come back the next day, and now Dagon has fallen again before the ark, this big statue. But this time, his head is broken off and his hands are broken off. The God you serve determines the power that you see. Here's the problem. I don't want to create a God that I have to keep picking up. I don't want to create a God that I keep to have to, pro if he comes from me, I have to sustain him. If he comes from me, he gets his power from me. If he comes from me, and can I tell you, there's a lot of people still propping up their various gods because even though it failed them this time, maybe it will, you know, like, yes, I, I did make more money, but now I need to make more money. So I got to prop my God up again. Yeah, that relationship went like the last eight, but maybe this one will be different. And all of a sudden, we're propping up our God right? And we're dusting off our God and we're trying to keep our God standing up so we can worship him. And I love it because then, then he falls down and breaks. I don't know about you. I'm so glad that I serve a God who picks me up, who will dust me off. 
I'm so glad that I don't have to fix the broken places on my God. My God fixes the broken places in my life. This is the problem of having your own God. When it comes from you, you have to sustain it and you have to keep picking it up and you have to keep worshiping it and trying to make it work for you. But when you serve the living God, his power, the God you serve, determines the God you see. His power picks you up, dusts you off, puts the broken places in your life back together. That's why God wants you to serve him. I think sometimes we think, you know, God is just mean or he's a narcissist or something. Like, why is he always talking about God to worship me and stuff? That's because he knows he has the power to save. Because he knows he has the power to deliver. He knows your God can't save you. Your God can't help. Yeah, you can fashion a calf and put his name on it, but at the end of the day, it's still an idol. And this is probably like, if you're serving a distorted image of me, you're not serving me. And if you're not serving me, my power can't save you. My power can't deliver you. Like the reason God continually says, serve me, worship me, put no other gods before me, serve me alone, worship me alone. The reason that that's the way God talks is because God knows, because I know I'm good and I will take care of you. And I actually have the power. I have never written a check that wouldn't cash. Like I have the power to save you. I have the power to restore you. I have the power to redeem you. I have the power to heal you. I have the power to deliver you. Like I have the power to bless you. That's why so many places, like in Deuteronomy, several places, he says, I set before you life and death, or he'll say, I I put before you blessing and cursing. And he's like, please obey my standard. Why? Because I know when you serve me, when you follow me, what God says, when we serve him, when we follow him, he knows he has the power to do what no other God could ever do. And and, and this this ultimately is is what what I think God is is saying really even to us in, in, in the beginning of this year, before we go any farther in this year, because there are things that glitter. And I think God is saying, hey, make sure something else hasn't gotten your attention. Make sure you're not placing faith in something else. Like, what a great time to evaluate. You know, this is why the presence of God is so important. I thought about Dagon falling down. And I thought, why did he fall down? He'd never fallen down before that we know of. It was like, oh, because the presence of God. The presence of God exposes the idols of our life. This is why it's so, remember when I'm disconnected, I become discontent. When, when, when I come, that's why it's so important. We come to the house of God and because in, in his presence, the presence of God always exposes the idols in our lives. When we come to him and we look to him, well, we look to him and we can't see him because something else is in the way. We have an idol. And this is really what I hear God say, hey, before you go any farther in this year, would you just call a time out today and stop? And would you check your heart and say, did I get something else worked into his place? Maybe I've got a good thing in a God place. Maybe I've got a bad thing in a God place. Maybe I'm trusting something else when I need to be trusting him. Maybe I've made up my own image of God and maybe I need to let him define himself so that I know I'm serving the living God and not an idol that I put his name on. And so I want you to stand today with me and I just want us to take a moment in his presence and just prayerfully say, God, before we get into this year, still the first month, like I'm going to ask for your help, God. In your presence, standing here, God, is there anything that's in your place? Am I placing my trust in something else? Am I looking to something else? Am I hoping for it in, like, God, am I even, have I distorted your image? 
And, and really, I'm serving a distorted image of you. I'm not really even serving you. I've, I've made my own calf and I put your name on it and I'm really sorry. It happens to all of us because sometimes we think all that glitters is gold, but it's not always gold. So you, I'm gonna ask our, let me go ahead and ask our prayer team to come. And then I want everyone else, if you bow your head with me and would you be so so honest with yourself just because here's the thing when we have a a God that's not the God then it doesn't have power in our lives it can't save or redeem or rescue and so God right now we are in your presence our heads are bowed and God we all love you. We're here because we want to be here. But God, I know a lot of times things get our attention. Sometimes things are the, the glitter of them, the glitz of them. But God, in this moment in your presence, we want every idol to fall before you. We want every idol to fall. So Lord, show us. Show us, God, if there's something in us where we... God had put the wrong place, the wrong thing in your place and show us if, if God, we have made a, an idol unto ourselves or if we've fashioned a God that's approving of things that maybe you're not approving of or God, the real, the, the, our real heart today, God, is we wanna serve you. We wanna serve you in truth. And so God, we just ask that the Holy Spirit right now would search our hearts and our lives and point out things that are out of order, out of priority in the wrong place or, or let us know if we're defining you instead of letting you define you, if we're defining your standards instead of letting you and if we're defining the way that you're served and worshiped and, instead of you. Because ultimately, God, at the end of the day, we want to serve the living God. We want to serve you because we know only you have the power to save. And so search us. We take a moment and just let the Holy Spirit search you. Just if you're at home, just take a moment and say, God, search me, show me. And then God, if there's something that comes to us, God, we just repent of it and say, God, we're so sorry. Sometimes we do put things in the wrong place. We're so sorry. Because sometimes we we relax your standard or justify things that don't need to be justified. And, and so God, we just ask you to forgive us because God, we wanna serve you, wanna serve you. And now with our heads bowed, just, I just wanna say if there's someone in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, in just a minute, we're gonna have, as we dismiss anyone who needs prayer come, but if you're in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I'm not talking about relationship with the church. Remember, not a relationship with a Moses, a relationship with Jesus. Like your relationship can't go through someone else. It's yours and it's real and vibrant and alive. And you're talking to God, God's talking to you. We know what it means to have a relationship. Not, not a religious affiliation, but a relationship with Jesus. But if you need that right now, I feel like probably the Holy Spirit is, will let you know you need it. And so you'll feel something on the inside of you. Maybe your heart will beat a little faster or feel, maybe you might even feel a little anxious, but it's really God trying to pull you to Him. But if that's you today, I want to make sure, don't leave here, let us pray with you. In just a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come. I want you to come. And it's so important that you just walk down the front and let one of these very safe people know I want to follow Jesus. I need prayer today. And then anyone else who needs prayer for anything else, we want to pray for you. We want you to come too. So God, we just thank you today for your presence and grace with us. God, we want to serve you, the true and living God. Lord, I do pray if there's anyone in this room or watching online that does not have a relationship with you, that they would come or that they would contact us online. And God, I pray that anyone else who needs prayer, God, they would come. And God, most importantly, I just pray you would meet them here. Save, deliver, heal, set free, God. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, 
Amen. Come on, can you give Jesus one more praise before we get out of here today? Listen, I love you. You are amazing. If you need prayer, please come. Everyone else, we say a big God bless you. We love you so much, and we'll see you next weekend for Build. God bless you. Hey, welcome to Pathway. Pastor Marty here, and I want to say how excited we are that you chose to join us online. It's incredible, and I want to encourage you now to stay connected with us. We don't want you to miss any of the content that we offer because we believe in connecting people to purpose, and we hope that everything that we offer will bring encouragement and hope and strength to you as you follow Jesus. Uh, There's a few ways you can stay connected. Number one is subscribe to our YouTube channel and then click the notification bell. You'll get notified instantly whenever we offer new content content. Also, you can like us on Facebook um, and you can follow us on Instagram. We were so excited to have you. I believe God has incredible plans for you. The best is ahead.